So we're going to talk today about um, CPT coding and reimbursement. Um, CPT code is does not equal reimbursement. It's a catalog and a list of services. Um, so and they're two separate items. I'm still getting the hang of where I click. So we're going to start off with CPT codes. Um, and I don't know how many of you remember before January 21st, 2013, is all genetic tests and molecular pathology tests were stacked together um, to get reimbursed. And they were commonly called the molecular stacking CPT codes. And basically, each step of the assay, such as DNA extraction, PCR, probe, hybridization, um, each, ha each of those sort of steps of an assay had different CPT codes, and laboratories would put all those CPT codes together to create a molecular coding stack. Um, so, um, the, so what happened is, is the AMA wanted to sort of create new codes, so it got divided into, um, so it, the new codes were called Tier 1, Tier 2, and multi-analyte assays with algorithmic analyses, or commonly referred to as MOZs. So why, why did the AMA want to put new CPT codes together? So there was getting, um, essentially it came down to payers wanted to know what they were paying for, and we needed a clear and granular system to do that. So um, part of my job was is um, to get information from laboratories throughout the country, and usually you, most of it involved the large reference laboratories and some smaller and medium um, reference laboratories throughout the U.S. So, and I don't expect you to be able to see this or read this, but so we took all the assays and the relative percentages and put them all together, and what you can see is is that relatively there's about 100 tests or so that really cover about 95 to 99 percent of the tests that were performed across the country um, a few years ago. So um, now it's probably changed a little bit, but, but, but this gives you an idea that most of the testing is do done in a relatively small number of tests. So in the new molecular pathology or MOLPATH codes, um, the tier one was created to be analyte specific codes. Those are the top 100 that, that are gene and analysis specific. And then the tier two codes were, were levels of complexity um, lumped together. And then you can go to the AMA website and actually see the most current list of, of codes. Um, so the general form, so part of the, what we had to do is sort of create a whole new format. So in a CPT1 tier one descriptor, we developed that the first part of the name would be the Hugo approved um, gene symbol, um, and then the long version of the Hugo approved gene name in, in parentheses. Um, gene names are in italics, so that part's in italics. The second parens include um, an example of the disease state or condition, and then outside of that, it's the gene analysis and the analysis type. Um, in, so some things about these descriptors is um, I was at one place and they said, well, if, if, if your disease or the condition's not listed in there, but it's related to that gene, you can't use that test, but that's not true. That, the disease and condition is an EG statement and not an all-inclusive list. Um, often common gene variant names are used, and the code includes all analytical services performed in the test. If there's cell lysis, DNA extraction, digestion, amplification, and detection. And then all, um, all the analyses are qualitative unless otherwise noted. So just to go over an example here is we have um, BCR ABLE, which is um, a gene fusion for chronic myelogenous leukemia. Um, we don't, the Hugo is actually two genes fused together, so it's a translocation. So we're using the um, 
the translocation or the cytogenetic information. And it's a translocation analysis for the major breakpoint, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. And then there's subcodes here um, um, for the minor breakpoint and other breakpoints in the trans in the fusion. Um, another example is cystic fibrosis, um, uh, where we have a genus analysis, a common variant. Um, ACOG and ACMG have some guidelines, and we didn't know if that was going to change or stay stable over time. And instead of listing that all, we just put the most uh, the ACOG or the current, basically the current guidelines. Um, then under CF, then you could have test for known familial variants, uh, deletion or duplication, full gene sequences, and in some cases, infertility, um, just for um, the poly-T analysis in addition to cystic fibrosis. Um, the array CGH is also commonly performed, and that at that time, a lot of the array CGH codes were um, oligo or back. Um, I think that's mostly gone away. Most people are now, most laboratories are now doing um, the 81229 for um, the copy number and single nucleotide or SNP variants arrays. Oh, we did put language in there that you couldn't use both of these at the same time. So either one or the other gets used. Um, in tier two, um, at the time, we had approximately 600 different genes or gene gene type analyses to be to, to be divided up, and these were the sort of that long, never-ending tail of that graph I showed you earlier. Um, these tests are less commonly performed, but they still meet tier one um, or I mean category one status. They're lower volume assays, so these were divided into nine levels of complexity. So um, for the tier, so just to give you an idea, and I'm not going. And some there's the examples underneath all of these. Um, is that um, tier two level one is basically one variant or one SNP um, testing. A tier two is two to ten SNPs or a methylated variant or some or somatic variant, somatic or tumor testing or. Um, Oncology testing is usually much more complicated than a single DNA blood test. So that had a little higher level of complexity. Then there was greater than 10 SNPs or, um, for Tier 2 Level 3. Um, in Level 4, this is where we start doing sequence analysis. So this is analysis of a DNA sequence of a single exon or if you're using some sort of multiplex of analysis of 10 or more um, exons or 10 or more variant reactions. Um, in level five, we go, we're go. we doing sequence analysis of two to five exons. And really, most of this was developed before the advent of massively parallel or next generation sequencing. Um, then we have 6 to 10 exons in level 6, um, 11 to 25 exons in level 7, and this is by the number of genes, the gene, how many exons it simply has. Um, level 8 is 26 to 50 exons, and then in level 9 it's greater than 50 exons. And actually there's very few in level there's very few genes that actually fit into level nine. So some of the questions that have come come up came up during this is what do you do if your gene or an, your favorite gene's not listed? So there is a miscellaneous code called eight one four seven nine. So at the time, what, during the conversion, a lot of labs said, well, my favorite gene. Um, fits in this level, um, and um, part of the requirement is is that you can't self-assign. You you if your if your favorite gene's not in on the level, then you have to submit a coding change proposal. Um, the me. Um, we can't get into the WebEx and see the slides. Um, we don't have do the you, meeting. Um, the, the meeting. 
The Auto leading is task part is the word genetics with a capital G. All right, I'm going to continue. Success. Thank you. All right. So, um, so um, part of the rules of the road were is that you can't use multiples of eight one four seven nine because some of the labs said, well, I'm doing lots of genes um, that aren't in that list. Um, can I use multiples? And the answer to that was no. Um, so, so if your favorite gene is not not in the list, then you can submit a ch coding change proposal. Um, and that's available on the AMA website. And um, you have to be able to reference, have reference, at, reference to document the clinical validity of that gene and that, with that disorder. You have to draft up. It, uh, in your submission, you include a clinical vignette and a description of, this, of the service. So here's an example for BRAF. Which is which is a, a gene test for colorectal carcinoma, and um, the and the common variant that's usually tested, which is B600E. So, in a clinical vignette, a 54-year-old man with metastatic colorectal carcinoma is being considered for targeted therapy with an EGFR uh, monoclonal antibodies. Initial molecular studies indicate the tumor does not contain any of the 12 common KRAS mutations. Um, and the tumor-rich sample is, accept, is submitted for BRAF testing. And then in a description of service, and this is the most common or the most common description of service um, or the most likely description of service. Paraffin is removed, DNA is isolated, it goes, it has, PC, um, there's PCR for the BRAF gene, it goes um, bidirectional. Um, sequencing and capillary electrophoresis and um, pathologists or other qualified healthcare professional evaluates and provides a report. Um, so once we get a CCP at the AMA, um, uh, we um, look at it for to determine the parameters for analyte as assignment. So in Mendelian somatic disorders, we look at for a de demonstrated relationship between the biomarker and the phenotype. In other words, does it have clinical validity? Um, do the biomarkers or the SNPs that have an association but not proof? This is more the GWAS, the GWAS type of um, assays or um, studies that are done um, have a, not a proven causative effect to the known clinical phenotype, but ha should have demonstrated clinical usefulness whether that's a, um, such as a high positive predictive value or a high negative predictive value directing therapy and management. Um, we did require at least two U.S. laboratories to perform the analysis unless it was proprietary or intellectual property um, issues existed. And that was provide, um, prior to the Supreme Court decision against Marriott a few years back. Analyses involved greater than 10 variants. Um, uh, for unrelated families, so we're really we're looking for tests that not the super 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 rare stuff, but something that that you see in multiple unrelated families to 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 pro to prove clinical validity. Uh, and then um, for the duplication deletion assignments in the tier two code, um, not all duplications and deletions got assigned. Um, uh, an analysis, it had to be greater than 10% of the disease alleles associated with duplications or deletions. Um, we did use database, professional databases to verify all the information that, um, for code assignment. So then um, NGS came along while we were in the middle of this entire process, and then labs started doing multi-gene panels. So the Association for Molecular Pathology submitted a coding change proposal to put multiple genes together into gene panels. Um, um, so um, they were quant quantitative genomic sequencing. So some of it included um, exome, exome testing and whole genome. I like how I said genome genomic sequencing testing. It's supposed to be a whole genome sequence analysis. 
Um, it included report and interpretation, separated the report and interpretation from the analytes, and this is the first time that we did this in the MOLPATH um, coding set, and that was because, at least in whole genome and whole exome testing, that you may have to go back and um, reanalyze the data for a different genetic disorder or a different indication. Um, so, and there is a fair amount of work with reanalysis and wanted to be able to code for that. Um, so the um, AMA had multiple open meetings, or at least one open meeting to discuss this with all the key, with key players and, or anybody who wanted to come and um, develop the new codes, which are actually in the um, 2015 um, CPT coding book. So here's an example of, of the new new ones that were created. Um, there was an aortic dysfunction, non-syndromic hearing loss, X-linked in intellectual disability, inherited col uh, colon cancer, uh, fetal chromosome aneuploidy, which is for the non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, we had targeted neoplastic genomic sequences. There's a lot. There was a lot of. Um, uh, nobody was happy with the descriptors when we got done. I, um, when we were working on this, I think my email blew up at least four or five times with uh, uh, people um, making recommendations and suggestions on, on the neoplastic genomic sequence procedures. And then there was a whole mitochondrial, whole exome, and a whole genome. Um, uh, the MA codes, um, CMS announced that the MA codes will be gap filled if the Medicare contractor de determines that the um, code is payable under the clinical lab fee schedule. Um, so um, in the most recent clinical lab fee schedule, there's, there's multiple MAs that have been, um, some of them have been crosswalked and gap filled, and we'll talk about reimbursements. So I always get this question, um, why, didn't ever, why didn't each gene get its own CPT code? And the answer is simply there's not enough, um, there's not enough numbers in, the CP, in um, CPT to do that. Um, the A, at the AMA, it did, we did recommend um, to, that the gene symbol, the Hugo gene symbol, the Hugo gene um, be added as a descriptor, especially for the tier two codes. Um, and then um, another question I often get is, um, well, can a code be moved from tier one uh, for tier two to tier one, and yes, and that has to be requested by a um, coding change proposal and approved by the AMA. And actually, um, in the 2016 book, um, or maybe it was even in the 2015 book, um, actually, I think it is in the 2015 book, there are uh, multiple codes that were actually moved from tier two um, to tier one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about reimbursement or the pricing process that CMS goes through. I don't know how many people are familiar with that or not, but um, to give you an idea of what um, CMS does. So um, actually, the new CPT codes were available. These new MOLPATH, the new MOLPATH codes that was available in the CPT coding book in 2012. Um, but um, at that, there was really no price or uh, there was really no price associated with the new code. So nobody, so labs didn't really want to use them or start using them. Um, so um, during that sort of, that 2012, that sort of transitional year between 2012 and 2013 when the, when the old uh, stacking codes went away, there was a sort of fight to, to determine whether the labs go, are all those new codes go on the clinical lab fee schedule or the physician fee schedule. Um, and um, the background in, on that is that all the stacking codes were on the clinical lab fee schedule, but the RUC, um, which is the Specialty Society Relative Value Update Committee, recommended that all the new codes go on the physician fee schedule. Um, um, so when you looked at that, there's, um, there was, there's federal laws that are related to, um, physician practice, 
um, whether it's MD versus P PhD, co-pays, anti-kickback rules, and physician signature requirements. Um, so CMS decided to place all the new codes in the Tier 2 codes on the clinical lab fee schedule. Um, so, so if you're looking at physician practice, whether it's um, physician fee schedule or clinical lab fee schedule, um, actually in, in, the federal, in federal law, for physician pathology services, the carrier pays for pathology services furnished by a physician to an individual beneficiary on the fee schedule basis only, only if the services meet the following conditions. Whether it's a surge path service, a specific um, cytopath, hematology or blood banking services, a clinical consultation service, and um, clinical laboratory interpretive services that meet um, the requirements. Um, part of the issue is between this is whether sort of the fight between MDs and PhDs on in, in, in reviewing um, mole path tests. So a lot of this is done by PhDs and not by MDs. Um, so so it, it was sort of a, a fight against, of MDs per, versus PhDs. Um, so if the codes would have gone on the physician fee, um, physician fee schedule, um, labs would have been required to collect a 20% copay. At this time, everything on the clinical lab fee schedule, there are no co-pays. So this would have been something completely new for laboratories to do, and not to say not sometime in the future that labs may have to do co-pays, but this is not something that's currently being done. There's also special signature rules um, um, that are not required of clinical laboratory tests regarding, uh, regarding physician kickback and purchasing um, for clinical laboratory tests. Um, pathology tests are paid on a different and much lower fee schedule in the outpatient setting than they are on the clinical lab fee schedule. And then indirect costs would be um, assigned on the base of, of all pathology indirect costs and, and hospital costs. So, um, so because there was a concern around physicians not being able to, who do actually review and sign out mole path test codes, uh, the, mole path, new, the mole path test codes, um, CMS did create um, a HICS-PIX code called G0452 uh, um, in, for the 2013 code book. And this allowed physicians or, M physicians or MDs to bill for the interpretation and reporting services that go beyond the technical reporting of the test. Um, it cannot be billed by non-physician geneticists or other lab personnel. And um, in 2013, and I'm not sure that it's changed at this time, it was reimbursed at um, $18.71 uh, per test. So um, for all the new test codes, there were, there's, CMS has two um, methods to determine reimbursement. One is crosswalk and gap fill. And I have to tell you, I was not that familiar on gap fill um, before mole path happened. Um, so for crosswalking, if the test is comparable to an existing test, CMS sets reimbursement of the two new tests to the existing test, and then it's assigned a local fee and corresponding national limitation amount. So while everybody was fighting in 2012 when the new mole path codes were in the CPT code book along with the stacking codes, um, CMS could have crosswalked um, the stacking codes to the mole path codes. But it, it, there was too much fighting whether it go, went on the physician fee schedule or the clin lab fee schedule. So um, there was so so it wasn't so it wasn't crosswalked at that time. So in 2013, then because they were new codes, then CMS determined that they should be gap filled. And in gap filling, CMS determines that there's no adequate comparable. Before the new new mole path code set came along, and it was like a hundred and it was around 110, 109 CPT codes. Um, the contractors had never done that many gap fills 
um, at one time. So um, when Medicare carriers or contractors are instructed to gap fill, it's an empirical process based on local pricing patterns. And the medical directors among the um, contractors can meet and share information, but they can't re reach consensus. Um, the gap filling actually take the process takes a body takes a year. So um, so during up to so basically during the first three months, um, the contractors get the amount, and then April around April 30th. Um, CMS posts an interim contract specified amount online. It allows a 60-day, um, by law, you have a 60-day comment period on the interim amounts, which is essentially May and June, and then CMS posts the final contractor um, and limitation amounts online, um, like midsummer time. Um, usually it ends up being around August. Um, then um, it allows for reconsideration for about 30 days, and which goes into October-ish timeline, and then the final national limitation amounts are made effective um, January 1st for the entire country. So it's a long process to get that value. I'm not going to go in this in too much detail, will I, but I will. Um, I provided it more for your information. Is that um, is that um, so? Here's the gap fill tier one codes. Um, but if you but if you're really super familiar with the, the MOLPAS CPT code, there's actually genes missing. So one of the genes I had mentioned previously was cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is not in the tier one. Is not in tier one here, along with um, some various other genes, and that is because um, um, primarily cystic fibrosis does not affect the Medicare population or the 65, the 65 and over crowd. Um, so CMS um, didn't set a price for for cystic fibrosis. And, and various other other um, codes or just codes in in the MOLPATH code set, tier one code set. Um, so this is sort of an exam again. Um, more more some more of the codes. We have um, some um, Lynch syndrome codes. Uh, more Lynch syndrome. Um, TMB cell gene rearrangement. Um, and HLA um, test uh, HLA. Um, so, in the 2015 book, as I mentioned previously, the genomic sequencing procedures um, AMA created the genomic sequencing procedure codes or the GSP codes. And all of 2015, CMS um, has has instructed the contractors to gap fill those. And that was very, and that process um, actually it was just I think last week um, CMS announced um, the and this was between uh, once once prior to giving this uh, slide set to uh, Blue Cross last week um, CMS just announced the gap filler rates for the GSP codes. So um, so for your favorite area in the United States where you are. I'm here in Indiana, so my uh, Medicare contractor is Wisconsin Physician Services, um, and then um, and so and then I have a nice. Uh, this was the most recent chart of of the ter of the regions that the uh, Medicare administrative contractors cover. Um, this does change at times um, depending on the contracts. Um, the contracts are renewable and does change over time. Um, so, um, so just sort of in summary, is um, many of the MACs um, in the gap fill rates um, seem to have coordinated their gap fill rates for MOLPATH, though um, some of the MACs, such as Palmetto, um, um, have established rates for all the codes in Including tier two codes, um, but CMS did not include them in their release. 
I do know that I just saw a local coverage decision um, proposal from WPS for um, tier, some more, some tier two analytes, and this is one of the first contractors I've seen do um, tier two descriptors besides um, Palmetto. Um, CMS hasn't finalized any reimbursement for any of the tier two codes, and each individual uh, Medicare contractor will continue to establish pricing for that. And I don't know, I'm sure for Blue Cross Blue Shield, as well as the MOLPATH community, um, the complete revision has had a huge impact on reimbursement uh, for molecular pathology. And that is the end of my talk.